What's up guys? Welcome to Anime Kahai. If you'd like to help me out, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Volume 13, Chapter 1, Unrest and Resolve, Part 1 A month had passed since my cabinet meeting. Today I was once again back in my control center, keeping up on my imperial observations. With all our intelligence being gathered here, Benamaru and I were basically living in this place. We still went back home at night though. For all I knew, if I left the control center unoccupied, Veldora and Ramirez might turn it into their secret hideout. I built that retreat for myself, and I wanted it to be used. Benamaru was keeping up appearances, too, so I imagined he was resting in his quarters as well. Not that I needed to worry about that sort of thing, I just didn't want my top commander collapsing from exhaustion before the final battle. We had staff assigned to the control center at all times by this point, three shifts running the complex 24 hours a day during wartime. I wanted to be sure nobody was overworked. Managing our health, at least, was something I wanted to be thorough with. Of course, my comrade Veldora was not a concern of mine on that front, and neither was Ramirez. Both of them got ample rest without me having to remind them, or really, they went out and screwed around all the time. They were excited about the war at first, but after a month of no movement, they seemed utterly bored with it. They were selfishly back in their own research lab now, telling me to inform them if something happened. Ah well. They just get in the way of things regardless, so I let them do what they wanted. Right now, the top brass in the control center was Benamaru, Soe, and me, along with my secretaries Sheehan and Diablo. Geld was there, too, I shouldn't forget about him. I felt bad about halting his construction projects for so long. I really wanted to get this war over with fast, before Frey started getting really mad. But that, of course, depended on my opponents. In war, the attacking side held the initiative, if the opponent never showed up, you couldn't fight even if you wanted to. The Empire's tank battalion, which I assumed would enter the scene in around 20 days, was moving far slower than expected. In fact, they seemed to be crawling along on purpose, trying to show off their might as they advanced. My Argos magic system kept a watchful eye on them day and night, but if you'd never seen a tank before, I'm sure they looked like terrifying creatures. Even a real monster was still gonna be afraid of giant, horrible opponents, and the magic beasts ranked or below in the forest had already fled far away from the advancing imperial force. So where were they? Well past their borders, that's for sure. Entering our nation without permission was fully against international law, as enacted by the Council of the West, but the Empire never did play by the rules. With things as they were, the question was how we could strategically take advantage of this. We could use it as a cover to stage a surprise attack, but we really did need to try talking at least once, I thought. There would be an order from the Empire to surrender, I understood, so until we could reply, I wanted to hold off on any attack. I know it's too slow of us, but we haven't finished our own preparations yet. I see no need to attempt to deceive them. We will decide everything in the first battle regardless. Benamaru agreed with me, not looking particularly concerned. So a bit relieved, I watched over our continued preparations for the anti-Empire war. Finally, all those days of waiting were about to come to a close. The Empire had stopped advancing and begun to assemble into formation. They were no fools, they had zero intention of fighting fair and square from the beginning, it would seem, so apart from the tanks, they had brought platoons of infantry into the forest as well. Vast numbers, in fact. Their total number had exceeded 700,000, around 70% of the Empire's entire force. We had known about this for days now, but it was worth going over again. Guess it's safe to assume this is the main force. I said. I imagine so. Benamaru agreed. It appears they intend to trap the Dwarven army, and their tanks are acting as decoys. So they're trying to avoid being pincered in as they advance into our territory. They're being remarkably careful, considering the size of this force. The tank battalion seemed slow not because it was a show of force or whatever. They had a more important goal in mind, to attract our attention until they could get their main force of foot soldiers in position. Not that we didn't see through their schemes, of course. Having control over information puts us at quite the advantage. Benamaru said with a smirk. <laughs> well played, Sir Rimaru. Dancing on your palm the whole time, were they not? Diablo, wasting no opportunity to praise me, also interjected. I was used to it by now, so I gave him a nod and a yep for his effort. Figure out how Diablo's mind works, and he's actually really easy to handle. Regarding the Imperial Infantry, I think we slightly underestimated the threat they pose. Each one of the soldiers seems decently powerful enough, and we've seen nobody defect from their ranks. 
they are assembling at a site about 19 miles away from Rimuru, the capital. That's where they are building a command headquarters and establishing their position. Soe, attracting the attention of everyone else in the room, went into further detail. Moss, it turned out, had given him some valuable intel as well, intel that proved accurate beyond complaint. It was a nice compliment to our Argos, and it gave us a picture-perfect map of the enemy's location. If they're this close to our throats, wouldn't it seem unnatural if we didn't react? I asked. No, I wouldn't be so sure. They see themselves as the superior force here, and what's more, they are trying to keep their actions covert. Presumably, they're preparing to demand our surrender, then spring right into action. <laughs> I agree with Sir Benamaru. If I could add to his counsel, 19 miles is almost the perfect distance for the Imperial Army. Magic-based observation loses its accuracy at long range. They are safe from any legion magic that might hinder all their forces at once. That, they believe, is how they are operating. It is hilarious to witness, but that is the best they are capable of. Apparently my concerns were for nothing. I thought the Empire would suspect our lack of activity to be a trap. But here I was being told that the enemy absolutely believed we weren't onto them. The only remaining concern was the strength of this enemy infantry. So, Soe, how strong are these foot soldiers? Soe brought up their threat level, so they had to pack a punch. Depending on his response, I figured we might have to rework our plans. If I could give a broad evaluation using the traditional human ranking system, they rank the equivalent of a B. There are many advanced troops who rank over A among them, and even the lesser troops wouldn't rank below C+. Even compared to the Knight Corps of the Western nations, I would call them quite a superior force. Yes, that was more power than I expected. But in this world, wars were all quality over quantity. A bunch of B rankers was nothing to trifle with, but a single A rank would be far more dangerous. Of course, I didn't want to underestimate their abilities as a fighting force. So there are practically no emergency recruits among them? They're all career soldiers? Right. From their training to the quality of their gear and tactics, they appear to outclass the Western nation's knights. Even your Hellflare would have difficulty piercing their magical defense. The way Soe put it, the Imperial Army had Legion magic cast over them at all times. They were a truly impressive force, trained to the hilt, and a platoon of them would be the equivalent of an A in rank. A force who truly worked as a team, such as Gopta's, could be a menace. It wasn't just the sum of each member's skill, it was more like exponential growth. If 20 or so of them deserved an A, simple arithmetic meant we had to fight against 35,000 of these A-ranked threats. Frankly, we couldn't let our guards down. They were a pretty dangerous foe. Ah, oh, we'll be fine. That's what the dungeon is for. <laughs> Force them to scatter inside the dungeon, and it'll be easy to destroy the enemy before they unleash their full force. Everything is just as you anticipated, Sir Rimuru. Not really, no. It just meant fending them off inside the dungeon turned out to be the best strategy of all. But depending on the enemy's war power. Wait. Hang on. Something dawned on me. No matter how much power the enemy brought with them, this interception strategy was valid either way. Inside the dungeon, it was possible to disperse their forces as we concentrated ours. That was why, if you really wanted to conquer the dungeon, you had to do it with small teams of elites, or you had no chance. Raphael strikes again, I thought. You know, looking back, I'm really glad we have Ramirez here. I couldn't help but blurt out. Benamaru agreed with me. We'll keep our city from being damaged, and it'll be a breeze to maintain our advantage. As a military commander, she's the last person I'd want as my enemy. He could give Frank praise like this precisely because she wasn't around to hear him. If he complimented her in person, she'd be sneering and bragging to him all day. Regardless. So it sounds like we've got no problems, but how is Gopta's force doing? My magic was currently powering a set of large screens in the control center, displaying scenes from multiple points. One shot depicted the area near the Dwarven Kingdom. 2,000 tanks were there, all in neat formation. They, too, were located around 19 miles away from the central entrance, the closest access to Dwargan's capital, exactly where we predicted they'd be. My main concern was the capabilities of these tanks. Their turrets were pointed straight at the large main gate, one I had visited many times by now. These so-called magitanks, or whatever, were supposed to be stronger than the tanks I was aware of from Earth. Perhaps those cannons had more range than those from my old world. I sincerely doubted their fire could actually reach the gate, but... In the public square on the other side of the gate, Gopta's and Gabal's forces were on standby. Both were leading their respective troops, diligently performing their duties. There were no unexpected skirmishes along the way, and the residents of the in-town were already fully evacuated. Now, as planned, Gopta's and Gabal's soldiers had rendezvoused here to serve as Dwarven Kingdom reinforcements. The Dwarven Kingdom has accepted Gopta's and Gabal's forces. 
This will be a united front, so they have not given up their command, said Benamaru. I wasn't worried about that, since Gazel already gave us his permission, but it looked like the Dwarven army kept their promises. Sounds like there's no problem, then. I have my concerns about how well they'll mesh with the Dwarven force, but if the Tempestians attack, and the Dwarves focus strictly on defense, I imagine things will turn out well. A military situation like this ran the risk of a jumbled, confused chain of command. Being a joint effort between armies of differing nations, they'd have to decide whose orders took first priority. If Benamaru was there, he could use his born leader unique skill to force his command on them all. Even in a battlefield where allies and enemies were mixed among one another, with that they'd never have to worry about accidental friendly fire. With the dwarves on the scene, however, things could potentially end in chaos. Therefore, strictly dividing responsibilities between offense and defense would actually make things more efficient. Maybe I'd better talk things over with Gazel one more time, just in case. Indeed, with the Empire deploying, there is little time left before the start of hostilities. It's about time for us to deploy as well, so would you like to contact him to make your final confirmations? Benamaru seemed to agree with me, so without hesitation, I reached out for our newly installed contact terminal. This contact terminal was a magical telepathic device that Vester had invented. The great thing about it was that it could convey not only voice but visual information as well. It was shaped like a desktop computer, complete with a monitor, mouse, and keyboard. Well, not a mouse, more like a palm-sized crystal ball. The terminal activated when you touched that ball. After that, just point out the person to contact among the figures etched into the keyboard, and you'd be connected to them. We kept it to a simple design so anybody could use it, although it did have its flaws. I said it conveyed visual information, but these were more like thoughts reconstructed in your brain. In other words, when you were jacked into your contact terminal, anything you thought could be picked up by the other side. This was the same fundamental concept as thought communication, and while I was used to it enough that I could shut out extraneous thoughts, newbies might wind up unintentionally leaking intel. Any wicked ideas you came up with could come through loud and clear to your partner and forget about hiding any secret intentions. I definitely wouldn't use this terminal to go cruising for dates. The average, untrained person was better off using the device's audio functions only. That's it for this video guys. Thank you for always watching my videos and supporting my channel. Shout out to the new members of Anime Kohai supporters. Darius King, Curtis Loban, Zephyrath, Jordan Redman, Bill Restom Cruz, Hadila Francisca, Jabari Graham, Alver, Normal Defate, Shavon Green, thank you so much for helping out. I'll see you guys in the next video.